Hello and welcome to the Book Club Review. I'm Kate. I'm Laura. And this is the podcast about book clubs and the books that get you talking. We love a prize and we love a special episode. And so we're delighted to have an excuse to get together to discuss the 2022 Women's Prize shortlist and its winner, The Book of Form and Emptiness by Ruth Ozeki. For those who don't know, the Women's Prize is the UK's annual book award celebrating and honouring fiction written by women. Key criteria for the prize are accessibility, originality and excellence in writing. Judges are asked to ignore the reviews, publicity spends, an author's existing reputation in order to choose the novel that inspires them, moves them, makes them think, and that they admire and enjoy. Perhaps no surprise then that many past winners feel like old friends, from last year's Piranesi by Susanna Clark to Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell, also known as one of my favourite books of 2020. Then there's Bel Canto by Anne Patchett, on Beauty by Zadie Smith, The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller, and Half of a Yellow Sun by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, to name just a few. Ruth Ozeki joins their ranks this year with The Book of Form and Emptiness, which Judge Chair Marianne Seagart said stood out for its sparkling writing, warmth, intelligence, humour, and poignancy. But never mind all that, what did we think? Does it hold up against the competition? It was, after all, a dazzling shortlist of must-reads this year, with Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead, the Island of Missing Trees by Elif Shafak, Sorrow and Bliss by Meg Mason, The Bread the Devil Need by Lisa Allen Agostini, and The Sentence by Louise Erdrich, also in the running. Keep listening to hear our frank but friendly take on the shortlist, Ozaki's big win, and whether we agree with the judges. Maybe you don't have time to read them all and just want to read one? Leave it to us, we've got you covered. That's all coming up, here on The Book Club Review. Kate, shall we confess to listeners that we have tried multiple times now to record this episode? The curse of the women's prize. <laughs> Various things came up and we had to keep pushing back. But you know what? I am so excited for this discussion because I have had the chance to kind of expand what I've read on the shortlist in the interim period. Yes, we were going to be joined by old friends Elizabeth Morris and... Sarah Oliver, but sadly, various family reasons meant that we couldn't do it. And I just thought, yeah, trying to get a group of busy women juggling jobs and families and trying to read and do a podcast, maybe it's always ambitious, but here we are now, you and me, <laughs> the A team. Yeah, <laughs> the originals. Let's get to it. We're going to start with Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead which is a book that we have talked about at length on the podcast. That's because, one, we really wanted to read it last summer. Two, it cropped up on the Booker Prize shortlist and so featured on episode 104. But for those who are new to Great Circle, here is a short description. From her days as a wild child in Prohibition America to the blitz and glitz of wartime London, from the rugged shores of New Zealand to a lonely ice shelf in Antarctica, Marion Graves is driven by a need for freedom and danger. Determined to live an independent life, she resists the pull of her childhood sweetheart and burns her way through a suite of glamorous lovers. But it is an obsession with flight that consumes her most. Now, as she is about to fulfill her greatest ambition to circumnavigate the globe from pole to pole, Marion crash lands in a perilous wilderness of ice. Over half a century later, troubled film star Hadley Baxter is drawn inexorably to play the enigmatic pilot on screen. It is a role that will lead her to an unexpected discovery, throwing fresh and spellbinding light on the story of the unknowable Marion Graves. The audiobook of Great Circle is narrated by Cassandra Campbell and Alex McKenna and published by Penguin Audio. Here's a clip. Little America 3. Ross Ice Shelf. Antarctica. March 4th, 1950. Final entry from The Sea, The Sky, The Birds Between, The Lost Logbook of Marion Graves. Published by D. Wenceslaus and Sons, New York, 1959. I was born to be a wanderer. I was shaped to the earth like a seabird to a wave. Some birds fly until they die. I have made a promise to myself. My last descent won't be the tumbling, helpless kind but a sharp gannet plunge, a dive with intent aimed at something deep in the sea. I'm about to depart, 
I will try to pull the circle up from below, bringing the end to meet the beginning. I wish the line were a smooth meridian, a perfect taut hoop. This book does feel like an old friend. It's interesting, isn't it? When you read things, I often think, you know, you've got your immediate response to the book. But then I always think it's interesting how much of it stays with you. I remember how happily immersed I was in this story and how vividly she creates this character of Marion Graves and the extra frisson that comes from knowing that this character was inspired by a real life aviatrix, Jean Batten, who is a New Zealand aviator. She made a number of record-breaking solo flights and flew from England to New Zealand in 1936. These are real women who were really flying back in the day. And I remember vividly the wartime scenes where Graves comes to London and works as a pilot for the Air Force. Women weren't allowed to fly combat, but they were allowed to fly supply missions. And there's these just incredibly cinematic scenes of having to navigate through these barrage balloons and extremely difficult and dangerous and the lack of support they got because they weren't really taken seriously by the largely male air force that they were working with. And so things like that are what really made it. It wasn't just a great story. It was a really powerful read that felt like a really natural fit for the Women's Prize. It wasn't just a great historical novel. It had this extra layer to it that made it feel really important and relevant as well. I remember us talking about how wonderfully it bridged the critical expectations we might have for a prize winner or a prize nominee and the commercial imperative of publishing. It was recommended on our summer reading episode last year and then cropped up on the prize. Cinematic is a great word because I have such strong recall of the scenes flying over Montana. And she has a flight actually over the coast mountains of British Columbia at one point where it almost goes terribly wrong. And then she's in Alaska later on. She's in Capitol Hill in Seattle, which is where my brother lives. And so it felt very local to me in some ways, but then global because, of course, as you say, she goes over to the UK during the war and then she is traversing the globe. So a real adventure story. We haven't mentioned the film star thread, Hadley Baxter, which is both a weak point, I think, in terms of narrative, but a strong point in terms of what it means for the overall story, without saying more than that. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I think the only other thing to say about it is it's quite a long book. I think it's over 600 pages long. But I remember it absolutely fell into that category of books for me where it was long and that was great. You know, when you're really enjoying something, you don't mind that it's long. You actually could be quite happily reading more. And this very much fell into that category for me. So yeah, recommended. Do we need to pass judgment on whether it should have won this award? Or should we hold fire on such things? I think we should try and round them up at the end. Let's have a little look at them all and then let's see what we feel. And so moving swiftly on, we come to The Bread the Devil Need by Lisa Allen Agostini. She's a writer, editor and stand-up comedian who comes from Trinidad and Tobago. So you were saying before we started to record that you have just finished this book? Yeah, this one is the freshest in my mind. And I am currently reading it at 34% on my Kindle. I'm enjoying it a huge amount. Okay, let's tell listeners what it's about. Alethea Lopez is about to turn 40. Fashionable, feisty and fiercely independent, she manages a downtown boutique. But behind closed doors, she's covering up bruises from her abusive partner and seeking solace in an affair with her boss. When she witnesses a woman murdered by a jealous lover, the reality of her own future comes a little too close to home. Bringing us her truth in an arresting, unsparing Trinidadian voice, Alethea unravels memories repressed since childhood and begins to understand the person she has become. Her next step is to decide the woman she wants to be. The audiobook is published by W.F. Howes and read by the author herself. Here's a clip. When I wake up that morning, oh God, my back and my belly was hurting. But I didn't want to make no noise and wake up Leo, so I bite my lip hard to make sure I didn't ball out for pain. Slow, 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 I turn on the bed and swing my foot over the side and get up like if his eggs are sitting on, and I feel with my foot for my rubber slippers before I stand up. It was dark in the bedroom, day clean, still a good hour away. I hear the neighbor cock crowing anyway as though he watched break. I didn't switch on the light because I live in here five years and I could find anything here with my eyes closed. 
I reach under the bed by the ashtray for my pack of cigarettes and lighter, slip them in my duster pocket and tiptoe out the room. When I reach the door, I remember the book I was reading last night before Leo come home. Yes, look at the way he did fling it by the wardrobe. I bite my lip again when I bend down to pick it up. I close the bedroom door behind me, soft, soft. In the kitchen, rubbish was falling out of the old grocery bag in the corner by the back door, and it had a smell like stale fish and cigarette in the air. The stove had a crust on it. Split peas boil over on top of the black grease coat in the white enamel. I didn't even bother to suck my teeth. I pick up my copper bottom kettle. Shiny, bright chrome. Fill it with water and use my lighter to light the stove. As I'm waiting for the water to boil, I sit down and start back reading my book. The table nasty, like the stove. So I'm reading the book, and you read it too, rather than listen to the audiobook. Yes, very different experience. <laughs> because I don't know the Trinidadian accents. As writing on a page, you do have to fall into the rhythm of it. Did you find that hard though? Because I was struck at how effortless that seemed. I, yeah, I yeah. almost that's what when I mean. you first start, you think, "Oh, is this going to be difficult?" And it's not. Within, I'd say, the mm -hmm. first sort of paragraph, you just mm. absolutely slip into this voice and the rhythms of this voice. And I thought that was one of the things that was really successful about it. It worked really well. I agree. I think that I have to fall into it every time I begin the book, though. Like my brain has to slightly recalibrate in that first paragraph to catch the rhythm. It's worth saying because it is genuinely full of words that I didn't even recognize. But that doesn't stop you understanding it. You absolutely work them out just from the context as you go along. And so often the way things are phrased is unfamiliar, but you absolutely can imagine it. But genuinely, sometimes there are words in there which I don't know what they mean. But it never held me up. It never bothered me. I was really happy just to go with it and the rhythm of it and enjoying experiencing this voice. This incredibly vivid main character who you really root for. I think this is a really interesting contrast to the Sherry Jones book, How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House, which was on the shortlist last year, which is set on Barbados. I actually loved it, but it was quite a difficult read in lots of ways, covering very similar territory to this one in that it dealt with domestic abuse, domestic violence, child abuse. It was a book full of darkness and violence. I think I was slightly the lone voice on that one in that I had listened to the audiobook and I had been so carried along by it, I almost was able to bear the things that happened in it in a way that I think perhaps I remember the others in the discussion weren't and found it really just too grueling. But strangely, with The Bread the Devil Need, even though in some ways, as I say, it, it covers very similar territory, it's somehow not dark in the same way. The mm. darkness is there, but there's something very warm about it. And the characters, I think, are where, as the main character is kind of lifted away from this darkness by her relationships with other people. So you as the reader almost are a little bit insulated by it as well. So for a book about domestic violence and incredibly difficult situations, it's a strangely enjoyable and uplifting read. I found it a thumping page turner. I would almost call it joyful. And yes. not only is it this incredible introduction to a culture I am unfamiliar with, Trinidad and Tobago, I feel like she is changing how I understand domestic violence. Alethea is so intelligent and self-aware. I'm still early on, but, you know, she understands her situation and she doesn't even justify it necessarily. But there's a confession. This isn't a spoiler. She shows one of her colleagues these horrible bruises across her stomach from a beating, a savage beating, beatings, I think, between Christmas and New Year from her partner. And she, out of character, shows them to her coworker. And her coworker essentially bursts into tears. She's so devastated. And from then on, her coworker is trying to talk to her about this. And she asks, I think, the question that is the default why don't you leave him? And Alethea so eloquently turns it back and says, why doesn't anyone ever ask, why don't men stop beating women? Why is it always back on the women? And mm. she's just so lucid. I agree. Such a page turner. 
It's really good. It's so pleasing because it is so beautifully sustained all the way through as well. It never dips. She holds these characters. She holds the action. She holds a quite complicated plot with quite a few big reveals as you go along and flipping back and forth in time. And it all just comes together. And the other thing that's just a nice little note to this book, which is common to most, I think, of the books on the shortlist this year, is a reference to books and reading. So one of the things that is salvation in a very quiet way, it's not dwelt on too much, is the main character's love of reading. What's lovely about it that all readers will recognise is that there's something that's really, she does for herself alone. It's her own personal, private escape thing that she does. And you feel happy for her as a reader, knowing that at least books are there for her. So yeah, it's wonderful. That sets up the stakes quite high, I think, in terms of our favourites. Kate read and loved the next book, Sorrow and Bliss by Meg Mason, last year. And so I was very excited to have an excuse to dig into it. Here's what they say about it. Everyone tells Martha Friel she is clever and beautiful, a brilliant writer who has been loved every day of her adult life by one man, her husband Patrick. A gift, her mother once said, not everyone gets. So why is everything broken? Why is Martha on the edge of 40, friendless, practically jobless, and so often sad? And why did Patrick decide to leave? Maybe she just is too sensitive. Someone who finds it harder to be alive than most people. Or maybe, as she has long believed, there is something wrong with her. Something that broke when a little bomb went off in her brain at 17 and left her changed in a way that no doctor or therapist has ever been able to explain. Forced to return to her childhood home to live with her dysfunctional bohemian parents, but without the help of her devoted, foul-mouthed sister Ingrid, Martha has one last chance to find out whether a life is ever too broken to fix, or whether, maybe, by starting over, she will get to write a better ending for herself. The audiobook is read by Amelia Fox and published by Weidenfeld and Nicholson. Here's a clip. My sister and I still look alike. Our jaws are similarly too square, but according to our mother, we somehow get away with it. Our hair has the same tendency towards straggliness, has generally always been long and was the same blondish colour until I turned 39 and realised in the morning that I could not stop 40 from coming. In the afternoon, I got it cut to two square jaw length, then went home and bleached it with supermarket dye. Ingrid came over while I was doing it and used the rest. Both of us struggled with its upkeep. Ingrid said it would have been less work just to have another baby. I have known since I was young that, although we are so similar, people think Ingrid is more beautiful than I am. I told my father once, he said, They might look at her first, but they'll want to look at you for longer. Such a contrast, I think, with the bread the devil need. Martha is in London. She is not from a wealthy background, but her aunt is extraordinarily wealthy. So she spends a lot of time in Belgravia and her eccentric artistic family are known in cultural circles in London. She herself is very beautiful, obviously incredibly witty. She just falls into a job at Vogue at one point, you know, straight out of college. And I was like, really? Really? Like those (laughs) those are hard to get but so desperately unhappy at moments in her life. Deep, dark depression, which is never named, partially because she isn't diagnosed, but I think feels very recognizable for anyone who has suffered or knows someone who has suffered from mental health issues. Yes, that's an interesting point because I think, is it depression? Is it schizophrenia? Is it some very particular mental disorder that she's suffering from? The descriptions of it are incredibly specific in a way that it becomes quite frustrating that it's never actually named because you think surely this is, you know, da da da. And you almost want to rush off and start Googling and diagnosing her yourself because no one else is. But I found that a really clever device. I know some people found it frustrating, but for me, it did work. It kept me interested. And I like the fact that although the character in Sorrow and Bliss is suffering from this one quite specific condition, In fact, because you don't know, it really then makes you consider all people who are struck down by something that they can't understand or explain or deal with. And it wasn't their fault. No one asks for this to happen to them. And I thought it was a really interesting way of evoking empathy and an understanding of what different people are going through at different times in their lives. I really enjoyed reading this book. 
I am slightly on the fence. Oh, I'm giving it away. But I'm slightly on the fence in terms of how I feel about it after the fact. I actually recommended it to my sister-in-law because I saw it on a shelf at the bookshop when we were on holiday. But I'm slightly apprehensive about whether or not it will land with her. It has great humor, right? Yeah. I never laughed out loud, but I appreciated this dry wit throughout the entire novel. I found it very funny. Again, yeah, maybe not like chuckling every sentence, but deeply funny in that way that you just really appreciate and enjoy when you're reading it. And again, that humor offsets some really difficult stuff that this character goes through that you go through with her and awful things that happen as a fallout from her own behavior. And you can't fix her. You know, you just have to read along and experience things as she goes. And this humor, and I love the relationship with the sister and the sister's children. And that family dynamic was really brilliantly observed, I thought. So much to love about it. The other thing I loved was it felt, I remember saying it when we talked about it at the time, it felt a bit like she must be writing from personal experience. It felt so vivid and deeply felt. And it was actually quite refreshing to read that she's not someone who's suffered this at all. And Mm. she was really just imagining what it might be like and had obviously done her research and thought about it a lot. But I love that. I thought as an act of invention, it felt very compelling and beautifully realized, I thought. It was definitely one of those books, you know, sometimes you read something and you have a bit of a book hangover afterwards. You're not quite ready to plunge into something else because you don't quite want to leave the book behind. And this was definitely one of those books for me. Hmm, Interesting. On to the next book, which is The Island of Missing Trees by Elif Shafak. She is a well-known name in the UK and Turkey as the successful writer of 19 works and counting. She writes in both English and Turkish and her novels have been nominated for numerous awards. Yeah, she's no stranger to a shortlist, is she? No, no. And I know the name, partially because she is such a regular contributor to The Guardian and she reviews other books. She also writes opinion pieces. She writes about what's happening in Turkey. So I have always meant to read her. And I was actually drawn to The Island of Missing Trees before the nomination and proposed it to my Canadian book club to read. Now, that was because my mum had come home from the UK with this beautiful blue hardback edition with gold foil on the front. So I took it to my book club and said, oh, do you want to read this? And everyone was like, wonderful, amazing. We figured out afterwards that it hasn't been released in Canada. So we might come back to it. But then it appears on the shortlist. I'm like, great, this is going to be it. This is my chance. Open it. Get 40 pages in. Don't make it any further. No, what happened? Well, a couple of days ago. Open it. Try it again. Don't get any further. Why? Well, let's turn to the synopsis. It is 1974 on the island of Cyprus. Two teenagers from opposite sides of a divided land meet at a tavern in the city they both call home. The tavern is the only place that Kostas, who is Greek and Christian, and Daphne, who is Turkish and Muslim, can meet in secret, hidden beneath the blackened beams from which hang garlands of garlic, chili peppers and wild herbs. This is where one can find the best food in town, the best music, the best wine. But there is something else to the place. It makes one forget, even if for just a few hours, the world outside and its immoderate sorrows. In the centre of the tavern, growing through a cavity in the roof, is a fig tree. This tree will witness their hushed, happy meetings, their silent, surreptitious departures. And the tree will be there when the war breaks out, when the capital is reduced to rubble, when the teenagers vanish and break apart. Decades later, in North London, 16-year-old Ada Kazantzakis has never visited the island where her parents were born. Desperate for answers, she seeks to untangle years of secrets, separation and silence. The only connection she has to the land of her ancestors is a ficus carica growing in the back garden of their home. The audiobook is read by Daphne Kuma and Amira Gazella and published by Penguin UK. Here's a clip. Once upon a memory, at the far end of the Mediterranean Sea, There lay an island so beautiful and blue that the many travellers, pilgrims, crusaders and merchants who fell in love with it either wanted never to leave or tried to tow it with hemp ropes all the way back to their own countries. Legends, perhaps. But legends are there to tell us what history has forgotten. It has been many years since I fled that place on board a plane inside a suitcase made of soft black leather never to return. I have since adopted another land, England, where I have grown and thrived. But not a single day passes that I do not yearn to be back. Home, motherland. It must still be there where I left it. 
rising and sinking with the waves that break and foam upon its rugged coastline. At the crossroads of three continents, Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Levant. That vast and impenetrable region vanished entirely from the maps of today. The problem is the tree, Kate. <laughs> Do you, before you go on, actually, Elizabeth Morris, who was supposed to be joining us today, did manage to record, between bouts of toddler crying because her child's got tonsillitis, did manage to record some thoughts on the island of missing trees. She said, Shafak has got too into the idea of narrating the tree. Trees are jealous of other trees. A moth told the tree about a thing. For Elizabeth, it was too much. She found it overwritten. She said, even though there was some incredibly lush, beautiful prose, it felt like purple prose. Shafak got so into writing the fig tree she forgot to shade in the story. All the characters sound the same. The plot hinges on revelations you can see coming a mile off, and it's all about the tree. <laughs> the tree. <laughs> I couldn't have put that better myself. And I mean, I feel like Elizabeth did due diligence and actually finished the book. So I think she's kind of giving me a get out of jail free card here because if it remains all about the tree, I can't what, do it. You know, people raved about that Richard Powers book, The Overstory, and that's all about trees. You know, don't like that what's book wrong either. with a book about a tree? <laughs> I didn't like the overstory and didn't get through it because of the trees. I would also say this is the next level of treeness. This tree is very emotional and real, and there's no sense that they are of a different species or might have a different. I mean, I, I can't say this authoritatively. What I read, it felt very much like a real character. And as Elizabeth said, you know, there are these other characters, but maybe they don't get as much attention. I was also put off by the opening chapters because our main character, as far as I got, is 16-year-old Ada, who's living in North London and seems to be at a comprehensive and she's having a really terrible time because her mother has passed away. And all her father does is tend this fig tree as he's grieving. We'll come back to this with a Zeki, but I really struggle with middle-aged authors taking on the voice of teenagers. Mm. It's hard to get right. Now, I'm not Aleph Shafak. She's a very accomplished writer, but it didn't ring true to me. And I was like, gosh, between the tree and this teenager voice that I don't even believe in, I can't do it. It's not for me. My mom loved it. I should have got a quote from her. My mom loved it. Thought it was amazing. She's going to listen to this. Be like, oh, <laughs> you didn't like it? I'm like, can't do it. The tree. Well, she's not alone. Briar Rose, reviewing it online, gave it five stars. Said it was a fantastic read. Really makes you think and respond. Just a magical book on every level. Really well researched, but affecting all the senses as Cyprus is explored. An unfolding of the history and the division, but with huge issues included. Wonderful characters and the voice of the fig tree, too. Sensitively written, but also raising issues which are so pertinent today. A novel of our time which explores loss, memory, and the responsibility we have to remember too, and of our responsibility to the ecosystem and our role within. It challenges us to think and consider such crucial issues and to protect all of life and treasure it too. But yeah, I couldn't resist another little negative one. Amanda Jenkinson said, This is an epic tale of love, grief, exile, and trees. I enjoyed learning about the history of Cyprus and how it affected the Greeks and Turks who called the island their home. And I enjoyed learning about Cyprus's ecology, particularly the destruction of the native forests, almost as tragic as the destruction of human lives. But what spoiled this book for me was the device of using an anthropomorphic fig tree as a narrator. This magic realist element simply irritated me. I could forgive the over-romanticization of the central love affair, the introduction of implausibly wise Aunt Miriam and her fondness for genies and exorcists, frequent cliches and stilted dialogue, but the talking tree was one step too far. But not for the judges, not for the judges of the Women's Prize. So maybe this is just a Marmite book. Yeah, it sounds like it might be a good one for book club. <laughs> Gosh, that's probably the only way I'll read it. And my book club might hold me to it, right? Like when it's released in Canada, it could well end up being something I have to get all the way through. Well, I'll be very interested to hear that discussion should it ever come around. OK, only one more book on the shortlist before we turn to this year's winner. But what a book it is. The Sentence by Louise Erdrich. I love this book. I'm very excited to talk about it. But first, what is it about? Louise Erdrich's latest novel, The Sentence, asks what we owe to the living, the dead, to the reader, and to the book. A small independent bookstore in Minneapolis is haunted from November 2019 to November 2020 by the store's most annoying customer. Flora dies on All Souls Day, but she simply won't leave the store. 
Tuki, who has landed a job selling books after years of incarceration that she survived by reading with murderous attention, must solve the mystery of this haunting while at the same time trying to understand all that occurs in Minneapolis during a year of grief, astonishment, isolation, and furious reckoning. The sentence begins on All Souls Day 2019 and ends on All Souls Day 2020. Its mystery and proliferating ghost stories during this one year propel a narrative as rich, emotional, and profound as anything Louise Erdrich has written. The audiobook is read by the author herself, published by Hachette UK. Here's a clip. A bookseller's awareness often travels with a browsing customer. Throughout the day, maps of the customer's movements form and collect in a corner of awareness. When the day is finished, books left out on chairs, sills, or askew have to be reshelved, and I always know where each book came from. I know which customer carried which book. I know which book was discarded by which person, who picked up yet another book to leave on a chair or shelf. As with other customers, Flora's ghost left a trail. After rustling around in the confessional, she always started in her favorite section, fiction, then slipped to nonfiction and memoirs, and conducted her hushed investigations along indigenous fiction. She investigated the sailboat table if my back was turned. Then she slid along poetry and cookbooks. Eventually, more rustling noises would occur in the confessional, then silence. Flora had been an extremely devout Catholic, and maybe the confessional, now labeled a forgiveness booth, gave her comfort. Yeah, it's interesting to hear Louise Erdrich's voice there. I didn't know anything about her. So this book was uh, a really exciting introduction, in a way, to this author that owns a bookstore in America and has written all these other books and I guess is quite well known over there. So it just felt like, oh, someone I just missed, you know? You posted about the book on Instagram and said something similar. Um, my mum was like, how does Kate not know of Louise Erdrich? Like, she's a <laughs> big deal. Like, I believe she's won the Pulitzer Prize. You know, she has. But like you, I don't think she has had much of a profile in the UK. She certainly hasn't been on my radar. Where to start? Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting because there's a lot going on in this book. On the one hand, you've got this almost crime caper that it starts out with, which gives you then the setup for where Tookie ends up. She's done time in prison and she's come out the other side and she then gets this job working in a bookstore. You're happy for her that she's found that and she carries on working there throughout the rest of the book. So you've got the setup that gets her to where she is and then you've got some backstory about how you understand about her character and why she is the way she is. She's then working in this bookstore. So there's this other thread about the bookstore and almost like bookshop culture, book references. It's very knowing about all that, that is very enjoyable if you are someone who reads widely, because you're going to hear all these references to books that are not explained. They're just dropped in in passing. And if you have read them, or you're familiar with that author, all of that is going to really resonate with you. And it's very enjoyable. At the same time, much as I loved it, I found it a bit cliquey and annoying. Sometimes bookshops can be a bit like know-it-all. Do you know what I mean? It's like a bit, ugh, you know, <laughs> it almost felt a little bit like I wasn't quite sure I wanted to be that complicit in it, even as I was totally enjoying it. But Kate, it was totally justified because she's talking about books with book buyers in a bookshop. Absolutely. We're looking for recommendations. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. No, it's all, know, it all belongs there. <laughs> yes. Then what happens is that other themes start to appear. So then COVID becomes a thing, lockdown, and Tookie's experience of that with her family, the riots after the killing of George Floyd. The bookstore is in Minneapolis, and I hadn't actually put two and two together, but of course that's where that event happened. And so there was rioting and disruption and reading it from Tookie's point of view as someone who lives there and obviously Erdrich herself I'm guessing experienced this it really was a very scary breakdown of law and order in a way that really resonates through the pages of the book the other major theme running through this book is this idea of contemporary Native American culture and they are also marginalized and there are lots of issues to do with appropriation of that culture one of the characters believes that she has Native American ancestry and one of the characters there's a thread about that one. And then what should we also say about that character? I think we can say she's our ghost. So then one of the customers <laughs> of the bookstore dies and then comes back to haunt Tookie. And so this bookstore has this ghost. So there's this other thread 
about this haunting. And I thought it's all dealt with, the whole ghost thing, with quite a light touch. But I also felt, we talked about this before, you and me, with any form of horror. There was a couple of moments where I was really like, <laughs> whoa, this is way too chilling for me. There's a scene where Tookie has to go to the bookstore on her own at night. And there's just like, the ghost is there. There's one point where they're both reaching for the lights. And I was like, ah, get out of there. It was really <laughs> slightly out of my... And I was a bit like, hang on a minute. Not sure I signed up for this. What stops this novel for me being a total success rave in the way that, for example, I felt about The Bread the Devil Need is that I didn't think, unfortunately for me, she didn't manage to sustain it. She didn't manage to hold all those threads together. It was very uneven. Mm -hmm. And I felt what I really loved and was really invested in was the story of Tookie and the story of the ghost and that whole plot thread. And then it gets caught up in these other things, which were interesting, but it just started to feel like I didn't know what it was saying anymore. I think it's very odd that the woman's prize description and I think even the blurb within the book doesn't really foreground that this is a Native American author talking about the Native American experience and her identity. And this is a bookshop specializing in Native American literature. And Tuki has been through so much, which is the legacy of colonization. And perhaps it's a marketing thing to reach a wider audience. Maybe they don't think that that narrative would mean as much to a British audience. And that's probably true. You don't have as much context as I would in Canada, where decolonization and reconciliation finally has come very much to the fore. And there is a real looking back at the crimes and violence and continuing violence against Indigenous peoples and Native Americans. There's so much in this book. But that thread for me is actually what holds it together. And then I just loved how many genres are kind of like tucked in there. It's so its own thing. And I wonder if her other books are like that. I really want to read her more widely. Yeah, I'm interested to read more of her. It's a little bit meta. Tookie gets a job in a bookstore and the bookstore owner's name is Louise. It's quite lightly done, but you're like, oh, oh, you know. Kate, I didn't notice that at all. <laughs> it's, 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 it's kind of it's slightly there. blink and miss it thing. But uh, I think it was at that moment, because I sort of started, again, as you say, knowing nothing about her. And as you say, it's not foregrounded in any of the blurb about the book. So as I was reading, and obviously this Native American thread is very powerful from the very beginning. And then this thing about the bookshop and the owner being Louise. And I, I thought, well, who is she? What is her expertise on this subject? And then, of course, I looked around and said, oh, oh, she's Native American. She runs this bookstore, Birchbark Books. It's, it's a whole thing. It all fell into place, but it's true. If you don't know any of that, it's slightly disconcerting. But on the other hand, it's incredibly engaging. I loved learning about this. I loved being in her world. She does the nicest thing. This bookstore is sort of the place you just want to spend the rest of your days in. It's so great. And then you finish the book and you're like, oh, you know, going to have to leave now. And then she gives you, at the end, a list of the books in the bookstore. It's the totally biased list of Tookie's favorite books. And then it's organized according to categories that you're familiar with from the book. So ghost managing book list, short perfect novels, the sailboat table, which I'm guessing is something in the real shop. And it's a thing in this bookstore over there, sort of front table. Books for Banned Love, Tookie's Pandemic Reading, and there's a whole section on Indigenous lives, Indigenous poetry, Indigenous history and nonfiction, which after reading this, you're really intrigued to read something else. I did find it uneven. I think I feel very at ease with the fact that it didn't win because I didn't think it was as good technically hey, as some of the other books. Hey, we're not supposed to talk about that yet. I just want to lay it down. Just want to lay it down now. <laughs> but it has such warmth and, you know, heart you can't help but fall for it. And I think that's why when you mention it to readers, that oh, the sentence, it's just one of those books. It's great. I loved Tuki. She is a great character. And her yeah, husband um, Pollux and her adopted daughter Hedda and all the women at the bookshop. Even Flora is so brilliantly drawn. You feel yeah. like you have seen, met and interacted with these people. Yeah, you fall in love with all of them. But we're not here to talk about the sentence, Laura. No, we've made it. <laughs> it's time to turn to that winner. The Book of Form and Emptiness by Canadian-American author Ruth Ozeki, who is also, by the by, a Zen Buddhist priest. The book tells the story of Benny, a young boy whose father has been out drinking, falls in the street, and is killed when he is hit by a truck. It's then about the aftermath of this as Benny and his mother Annabelle grieve. As he grows older, Benny starts to hear voices. Objects talk to him, tell him their stories. He starts to feel like he's being overtaken by madness, 
But is it madness or another way of seeing the world? As Annabelle tries to understand and to help him, she is grappling with her own sense of loss and feeling overwhelmed by her job, which is to scan the news making notes for a media agency. As part of her job, she is required to save the print media she analyzes. But around this, other objects and possessions start to pile up. Meanwhile, Benny finds an unexpected place of sanctuary, the library. The audiobook is read by Carrie Shale and published by Canongate. Here's a clip. He selected a book from the day's array and opened it and started to read a page or two. Well, not read exactly, not at first, and not in any systematic way like left to right or top to bottom. His was not the steady grazing of the methodical cow, but rather more like the browsing of a deer in the springtime, when the leaves are tender and young, a nibble here, a nibble there. As a young child, he'd loved being read to. But then, when he got older, he started playing video games and never acquired the habit of reading whole books by himself from cover to cover. Now he didn't quite know how to proceed, so he just flipped through the book in a non-linear fashion, sometimes starting at the back and sometimes in the middle, not looking for anything in particular, but enjoying the sensation of turning the pages, which seemed to give the pages pleasure too. It didn't take long for the words to start to draw him in with their meanings, and he found that in order to understand what they were trying to say, he needed to go back to the beginnings of sentences, paragraphs, chapters of the book itself. And so he did. A book must start somewhere, he discovered. Starting with the first syllable on the first page, he mouthed the words as he read them, pronouncing them out loud as they combined to form sentences, until he felt as if the words were animating his lips, borrowing his tongue, as they whispered their way into the world. I'm very pleased that you've read this book in full, because I have not. And I want to hear all about it and what you thought of it. And then I will share a tiny little smidgen of my experience. But it holds no weight. No one should really listen to it because it's not fair when you haven't read the full book. Over to you. I love that quote and that last bit, the words whispering their way into the world. It's another book with a lot going on. This family story is the anchor, the story of this boy, Benny, and his mother, Annabelle. You really root for them, you grieve for them, you care for them deeply, very quickly. She engages your empathy. Annabelle is trying her best, she really is, but she's overwhelmed by her grief and trying to look after Benny and help him and also just trying to provide a home for him and she has to work and her job is that she's a sort of news media scanner. She's working from home, she's surrounded by banks of computer screens and her job is to scan all of these different media outlets and make notes and archive the information. So she is being inundated with terrible things from all around the world all the time basically. And she's trying to manage her family life. And her son is quietly going off the rails. He starts to hear voices, objects that are talking to him. And the objects are very characterful and engaging. I mean, they annoy him no end. He can't hear himself think because he's surrounded by this cacophony of objects telling him things. So the shoes tell him that they want to be worn and they want him to go running in them because that's what shoes are like. The teapot on the shelf says that it wants to be full of tea and wants someone to pour a drink from it because that's what teapots want. Paper remembers the tree that it once was. So it's a book where even in all of the objects that surround the characters in this story, there's a lot going on. And the book itself, Laura, is indeed, is it not an object? And so there's this metatextuality. The book is an object. It's also a conduit for ideas. And then the reader is an active part of that relationship. So you, the reader, become actively engaged in this book. You're referred to it sometimes. The author is in there. When Benny goes to the library and he makes his way up to the ninth floor, there's a lady up there who has dark glasses and gray hair and seems very Ezeki like And she is sitting there typing. And I actually marked this passage because I thought it was the most wonderful description of uh, typing. <laughs> Benny listened to the small, quick sounds of the typing lady's fingers. Earlier, her tapping had sounded like raindrops, but now it sounded more like a flock of starlings lifting from a wheat field and then settling again, blending back into the library's ambient hush. Well, maybe not starlings, maybe waves. Maybe the starlings were changing into waves, washing up on the sand and tickling all the pebbles and tiny broken shells before receding again. In and out, waves and starlings, the tapping of fingers on a keyboard, 
the rustle of a turning page, the exhalations of the stars, punctuated by an occasional snore. Benny heard all these sounds rising and falling, and he knew, too, that they, like the voices he heard, were always there, and would always be there, coming and going, somewhere in the background. The writing is something else. The way it's written, in some ways the language is quite... Elizabeth put it quite well when we were talking about it. She said it's quite uncluttered, the prose. And that's very nice because this is a book that is really considering our relationship with objects and the things around us. Another thread that's going on here is there's a whole riff on that Marie Kondo book, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up. And so in this novel, there is a character who is a monk and she comes to a realization that the Zen understanding of objects and their place in the world could be packaged up, it could be written in book form, and she could help others understand how to harmonize their lives, live in balance with the objects around us, and not feel so overwhelmed by everything. And so in the novel, she writes this book, and this book is very successful. She then is traveling the world. And so there's a way that this all connects up. So, you know, there's a lot going on. <laughs> and it won. I haven't mentioned Walter Benjamin. Or Benjamin, Walter I Benjamin, think. Benjamin, exactly. Walter Benjamin who wrote an essay called Unpacking My Library, which is part of a book called Illuminations, which I found online and read. And I have to say, it's very hard going, I thought. He is linking the activity of collecting books to the workings of memory. So it's, again, picking up on this idea of objects and the resonances that they have and how objects, you know, on one level, they're simply objects. But on the other level, there are memories, they're feelings. There's a reason why we have the things that we have, usually. And they're all vessels for all of that. One thing I did love about that essay, he also quotes the humorous retort of the French man of letters Anatole France, who, when asked if he had read all the books in his library, quipped, not one-tenth of them. I don't suppose you use your Sèvres china every day? Sèvres being an unusually costly, ornate and highly prized type of porcelain. But so there's that, there's Borges. I don't know about you, I've never read any Borges, but I found a very interesting BBC Culture article, which I found fascinating actually having read this now. Borges did the ultimate high-low fusion, mixing pulp material, detective stories, sci-fi scenarios with architectural structures and philosophical preoccupations. He loved Buenos Aires, but the world he created in his fiction was essentially a world made out of a library. Ficciones also reflects Borges' original and postmodern approach to books and texts. As he noted in 1941, the composition of vast books is a laborious and impoverishing extravagance. A better course of procedure is to pretend that these books already exist and then to offer a resume, a commentary. More reasonable, more inept, more indolent. I have preferred to write notes upon imaginary books. And final thought, the World Wide Web, in which all time and space coexist simultaneously, seems as if it were invented by Borges. Take, for example, his famous story, the Aleph. Here, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet becomes the point in time and space that contains all time and everything in the universe. As Borges writes in the story, I saw a small iridescent sphere of almost unbearable brilliance. At first I thought it was revolving. Then I realized that this movement was an illusion created by the dizzying world it bounded. The Aleph's diameter was probably little more than an inch. All space was there, actual and undiminished. So to anybody who's read the Book of Form and Emptiness, instead of that all sounding very complicated and <laughs> you know, actually you'd be thinking, oh, Oh, right. Yes, okay. I see that. All right. When, when I okay. read that, I had a real sense of, oh, I see. You know, so she's weaving in all of this. So, oh. you know, this idea of books and libraries and high low itself, fusion sort of rings yeah. true. <laughs> and the Aleph is a character in this book. So she's a girl oh. that Benny meets. For much of the time, I was wondering whether she was real. It's another thread. But anyway, so there's this whole idea about this character embodying this principle of, of, of everyness, oneness. Another character known as the Bottle Man is quite helpful to Benny, and he is a sort of hobo, a guy in a wheelchair who smells and seems to live at the library. Like Benny at first, you're quite judgmental of that. You just think, oh, God, he's not someone you should be hanging around with. Is he safe? And the novel asks you to look at him differently and say, you know, look, this man is a poet and a thinker and a writer. And so he is very helpful to Benny and somehow seems to embody the Walter Benjamin aspect of the story. So, yes, perhaps we should come to what this novel is actually trying to do. I think one of the things that it's trying to do, and it does very well, is it's asking us to consider the way that we think about the world. Is someone who hears voices and thinks that the objects are talking to them crazy? Or do they have a different way of viewing the world from the way that we are used to? And should those people be marginalized and punished and ignored? Or should we be trying to 
consider their point of view. I think it's one of the questions that's raised. You're so invested in Benny and his mother, Annabelle. You know, you really care about them and you really root for them. You're very open to that because you want to understand him and you want to try and help him. The novel, in one way, is exploring that, which I really loved. I thought was great. And then there's the Zen message. Wow, what's going on with us and our objects? You know, this consumerist world that we live in, how do we change from people who just needed enough to get by and to live and be comfortable to suddenly people who wanted everything? And is there any limit on the amount that we want? How can we learn to coexist with all these objects that we've created? What Ruth Azeki seems to be suggesting is let's consider the resonance of that object. Let's consider the memories it contains. And so it, it's a really interesting, challenging, thought provoking book with so many layers. You know, I could talk about this book for about five hours and I don't think oh I'd have anything to say. Please about Please don't. It. <laughs> <laughs> I know I've got so much to say. I've got 38 pages of notes to get through. But I will say I absolutely loved its twists and turns. Did you? <laughs> I did. And it's, oh, it's, again, it's another one where it's a long book. It's 550 pages long. And at one point, probably about 450 pages in, I really had a moment of feeling like, you know, I could happily, I feel like okay. I'm sensing I'm getting to the end of this book. I could happily go on. I would happily have followed her for more pages because I found it so interesting where this mind of hers was leading me. And I love that about it. I'm sensing you didn't have the same experience. <laughs> Similar to Ayla Shafak, I want to love Ruth Ozeki. I felt remiss for not having read her. And I picked up or had recommended to me at a bookshop A Tale for the Time Being, one of her other novels, I think from a few years back. And I read that, got 200, 300 pages in. I think it's also around 500 pages. And I was like, no, I just don't want to go on. And then I started this one, The Book of Form and Emptiness. And I read my 10% sample. All those feelings came flooding back. I just don't care. I don't really like her prose style. The main character, well, A Tale for the Time Being, Ruth herself is almost the main character, coming back to the metafiction. And she's found this diary of a Japanese schoolgirl that's washed up on the shore of a West Coast Gulf Island, you know, not far from where I am right now. And I just thought that, again, kind of similar to Shafak. I was like, I don't think this is what a young Japanese schoolgirl would sound like. And so coming up with against Benny, who's even younger, I think when you first meet him, I was like, oh, is this going to be another teenage narrator written by someone effectively having to research what it might like to be that age right now with those experiences? And honestly, nothing you have said makes me want to read it. But it won. It won. So there must be something there. I thought it had reach and scope that the others lacked. I think Ambition? Did, yeah. I think it did work, actually. I thought she did hold it all together in a way that I almost was worried at a couple of times that she wouldn't, but it did. I felt a little bit, a tiny bit let down by the ending. I think that was my only thing. But almost, as I remember saying once about Great Circle, I think I was just sort of sad it had stopped, you know? It's like, okay. I think <laughs> probably there was no pretty. way she could have ended it where I wouldn't have been like, oh, we're not going to get some more. I thought one of the things she did brilliantly was that she balanced a really good plotty story with a strong emotional hook that was incredibly readable. It reminded me, for example, of The Goldfinch by Donna No, Tart. no it way. Did. It did. That teenage character reminded me very hmm. much of the boy in that. And okay. that kind of sense well. of a coming of age story and also the grief and the relationship with the parent. All of that, I thought, was there. That is high praise. That could almost convince me to revisit my existing prejudices and keep going almost but so you've got that going on and then you've got all these really quite complicated philosophical ideas that she's weaving in there that I thought she did very successfully it was, it was very cleverly done I thought I was slightly uncomfortable with the inclusion of herself in it when I got to that I was like mm, I'm not sure about this Ruth <laughs> why it wobbled for me slightly at that point but overall, a bit like with a Louis Erdrich, there was such warmth and heart to it. I went with it. It took me places, this book. So is this the book that you think should have won? We're here now. Are you happy with this winner? I am. It's the book that I think was the most worthy of the prize. But you know what? If I was going to recommend to people to read one from the shortlist, yeah. I would actually say read The Bread the Devil Need. Oh, interesting. I know. Even okay. though I love the sentence so much, but I thought The Bread the Devil Need was brilliant. Well, I can't comment on the book of form and emptiness. 
or the Island of Missing Trees. So they're out of my running. But out of the others that I did read, the sentence is currently top for me, 100%. But I haven't finished The Bread the Devil Need, and I am really enjoying it and really excited. So maybe it will pivot to the post at the very end. A great shortlist, I think. Really happy with this list for the Women's Prize. Yeah, agreed. It's such an interesting, varied selection of books, all characterized by some really excellent writing. And hey, all very good discussion books, which we love. Yeah. That's nearly it for this episode. You'll find book titles in the show notes and full descriptions, plus a transcript of this episode on our website. Whether you listen when it comes out or at some point years in the future, maybe you have thoughts. Perhaps you've got a tree book to recommend to Laura or a favorite novel from Ruth Zeki that you think I should read next. There is a place for these and that's the episode page on our website where you'll find a comments forum. Please do drop us a line. We love to hear from you. Comments there go straight to our inboxes and we will reply. So keep in touch. You'll find it all at thebookclubreview.co.uk. That's also where you can sign up for our bi-weekly-ish newsletter for reviews in between episodes and suggestions of what to read next. You can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Book Club Review Podcast, on Twitter at Book Club RVW Pod, or email thebookclubreview at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to support us, you can rate and review the show on your podcast player, tell your friends about us, and share on social media. It all helps us to find new listeners. But for now, thanks for listening and happy reading. <laughs>